here. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter number 4. 1 Kings chapter number 4. All right. Praise the Lord. I love the Bible. Y'all love the Bible? So we're in our series on embrace your royalty. Did you know your royalty if you're a child of the king? If you're a child of the king, you're royalty. And uh, we've, we've gone over many, many thoughts uh, on uh, the kingdom. We, we went over God's kingdom, what it is. We, we talked about our operating beliefs and value, victory, and, and virtue. We spoke about the keys to the kingdom. I love my keys to the kingdom. I'm always using it, uh, using them even when people don't know that I'm using my keys. And uh, I, we talked about last week how to advance in the kingdom and how when God gives you a pound, pound it. Remember that? Everybody, we left, pound it. I hope you're pounding it this week and multiplying your pounds. Not physically, but, you know, but perhaps spiritually, unless you want to physically, right? <laughs> Put on a little bit of muscle. But the idea is you want to increase for the glory of God, okay? And, uh, and so uh, we went over that last week. And I got to thinking, uh, you know, what would, be, what would be good for this week is to not just talk about the concept of growth with regards to uh, multiplying your talents, multiplying your pounds, but how do you actually release your potential? How do you release your potential? Because all of us have potential inside of us, but not all of us understand or know how to release it. Or if we do know how to release it, our times and seasons, our ages and stages of life changes. And so at one moment we learn and we know, man, I'm excelling. And then we hit another season in our life and we're like, oh, I'm not too sure how to do this at this stage in my life. How do I grow here at this spot? Is my life over or or is there another level that I can go into? And so uh, today we're going to be looking at how to release your potential. Uh, Our theme verse uh, for Embrace Your Royalty is in your notes. It's uh, Revelation chapter number one, Revelation chapter number one. I will read it to you, but it should be a a copy uh, of the verse there in your notes at the top. And it says this, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us. Isn't it nice to be loved by God and washed us. Oh, it feels good to be clean from our sins and his own blood. His blood was perfect. And hath made us, what's that next word? Kings and priests unto our God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see that we are grafted into the blessing. We are adopted into the family. We realize that God has made us his children. And so therefore we are joint heirs uh, to uh, the throne of God. With Christ we rule and reign. And he's given us his power. And as his children... We are empowered with royalty. He's made us kings and priests. Listen to this. You don't have to wait to have eternal life for when you get to heaven. You get eternal life the moment you get born again. The moment you repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ, it's finished. It is done. Uh, Telatesta. I mean, it is, it's in you. Amen. He's in you. And so a lot of the, the, the uh, understanding is, well, how do I operate with him in me? How do I operate with nobility and royalty? How do I do that? And that's what this series is intended to do. Uh, Simply because many of us have really, how do I say this? Tainted, destroyed, destructive uh, thought patterns and habits that 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 we were raised with. Can we all agree to that? And there's a clash when you come into becoming a Christian and still operating off of your old mentality, the flesh system, the, 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 the ideology of your, of your past. See, we want the ideology of Jesus Christ. And so he's made us kings and priests. I want to read a few verses in 1 Kings chapter 4, and then we'll pray, and we'll jump right into uh, our message. 1 Kings chapter 4, I thought, you know, if God's made us kings and priests, we want to we wanna embrace our royalty like a boss. No, no, not like a boss, like a king, right? And I got to think, if you, if you just add that, like a king. Say, like a king. Like a king. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach this message like a king today. And you're going to receive this message like a king. Uh, you say, what, what are you getting at? Well, I think it's important that if we're going to uh, be the royal people that God wants us to be, we need to take a little look at the rise to power on how perhaps somebody who, uh, who became a king, what he did and how he did it. So we can begin to see how his potential was released. Let's take a look. First Kings chapter four. We'll look at Solomon. Verse number one, the Bible says, so King Solomon was king over all Israel. And these were the princes which he had. Notice the, the different offices that you'll see that a king has. 
rulership over. And these were the princes which he had, Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest, uh, Elehoreth, and Ehiah. I like these names, Ehiah, you know, <laughs> the sons of Shisha, scribes of Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, and Zabad, the son of Nathan, was principal officer and the king's friend. So you're able to see that, that, king, that Solomon is king and he's got a lot of administrators and people in positions. And we're getting, to, we're getting to see how authority and wisdom orchestrates and sets up rulership because you start realizing that as a king, you can't do everything. How many of you found that out? You can't do everything. You need people. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Now say to be my servant. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but kind of really. <laughs> so we see that he's got people in different positions. And he's learning to leverage his rulership. And he's got officers. And look at verse number 20. It says, in Judah and Israel were many, uh, were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river unto the land of the Philistines, under the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon, you're going to see, and perhaps you already know this, is the wisest man on the planet at this time. Everyone is coming from all over just to hear him speak, to watch his leadership to listen to his songs, to see how he administrates. People are coming from all over the known world. And the Bible goes on to say in 22, it says, And Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour and three score measures of meal, 10 fat oxen. Yeah, I love meat. Good job, Solomon. And 20 oxen just out of the pastures and a hundred sheep besides hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted uh, fowl. Man, this guy loves his meat. Any meat eaters out there? Any hunters out there? I mean, it looks like he, he, this is provision. And don't ever forget that God's given us the animals to enjoy. Uh, we are to take care of enjoy them. And when we do kill them, we should eat them. And that's what the Bible says. Just make sure you give thanks over that thing. And it says this, verse number 24, for he had dominion, say dominion, dominion. over all the, re uh, the region on this side of the river. And now move on down a little bit. And it says in 26, and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And those officers provided victual for King Solomon and for all that came unto King Solomon's table. Every man in his month. Now, say the next three words with me. Ready? Begin. They lacked nothing. You want to talk about a powerful leader? The people that were connected to him and served him, loved serving him because of his wisdom. Because he took care of them. Because he understood how to love people, help people, value people. And to add value into people, to help them to believe in what they cannot see, so that they would one day achieve greater things. Solomon is just super wealthy, super powerful. And we see, look, look, look at this spot right here, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is of the seashore. Understand this real quick, just a little secret. Before we pray. All his temporal wealth. All the success. All the food. All the leadership. All the servants. Was a result. It was not. The root. But it was the fruit. Too many times we want other people's success. And we look at their fruit. Without finding out what the root. That produced the fruit. Are y'all following? The root that produced all that temporal fruit is in verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is of the seashore. 
it's almost like God just opened up his heart and his his understanding was continually to grow. It wasn't a one time. It was a development that was put in him, but it was a cultivation of a lifetime of learning and walking with God. And here's how it manifolds or unfolds or bears fruit. Look what it says in verse number 32. And he, Solomon, spake 3,000 Proverbs. Anybody like the book of Proverbs? Love it. It came from the heart of Solomon, which came from the heart of God. And his songs were 1,005. See, he wasn't just a, 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 a philosopher. He was also a poet. He didn't just understand uh, deeper things with regards to methodology on one side of the brain. He also had a very uh, musical, spiritual side as well. That he would he would unfold musical rhythms that would just bless people, and that was as a result of the wisdom that God put inside of his heart. And it says this: it wasn't just uh, philosophy and 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 music. Look at verse 33. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowls and creeping things and of fishes. It looks to me like horticulture, ecology, uh, all of it. He would look into it, and because wisdom was in him, the whole thing of a tree or an ant or a fox or a greyhound, he would walk into it, because he had the secret on the inside to open up and unlock and open up anything that he came across. Powerful. Very powerful. It says in verse 34, And there came of all people to hear, hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard his wisdom. If you knew that there was a man that could operate like this wouldn't you go find out from him talk to me about this and you would just sit and listen today one that is greater than solomon we shall hear from we will look at the words of our lord jesus christ the greatest man who's ever lived on planet earth and has demonstrated his deity before thousands and the fruit of his spirit and his actions is still seen today over 2,000 plus years later because he is the root of all wisdom and all power. And so today, without further ado, let's pray and let's ask God to open our hearts to give us that same wisdom. Father, we recognize that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We humbly beseech you and ask that you would give us a wise and understanding heart today. That we too, like Solomon, would know how to release our potential for your glory and for your honor. Move in a special way. Open our ears. Help us to be focused and attentive. Any areas that are hindered, blocking, where there's unbelief or sin or fear, cast it, remove it, cut it out, and flow in and through us in such a powerful way today. And if there's anyone here that's not saved, let them know the joy of what it feels like to be born again. Let them be saved today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's look over in our Bible at Matthew chapter number five at Jesus's wisdom. Amen. Let's take a look at Jesus's wisdom. And we're going to look at how to release our potential by realizing, removing and releasing certain factors in our life. And we're going to look at Jesus and what he says. And so Matthew chapter number five, Matthew chapter number five, you're turning on over there. And look what it says in verse number 14, Matthew 5, 14. 
Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, read it with me. Ready, begin. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God, Jesus, is saying that you're the light of the world. He's saying that, that don't hide your light. I want you to shine your light. I want you to let your light shine so much that others will look at your life and they will glorify me, is what he's saying. That, that's exactly what he's getting at. Now, how many of you have a hard time with believing in your giftedness? Is there anybody that struggles with their self-esteem or uh, self-doubt and, and really struggles to be able to step forward and, and embrace the gifts and calling of God? I think all of us do at a time or two in our life. And so number one in your notes, realize your power, realize your power. You do have power. Uh, I think of that song. I got the power, you know, I, I, I got the power. Amen. Don't worry. MC Hammer's not going to start dancing up here. OK, <laughs> but but we, we we've got to realize that Jesus has given us power. In fact, the psalmist says this. Uh, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Look up here. You are wonderfully made. Stop beating yourself up and start believing in yourself. Because if you're going to be there beating yourself up and beating everybody else up, then you're just you're hurting everybody and you're hurting yourself. And if you're sitting there ta uh, 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 harming other people, what are you doing to yourself? You need to start appreciating the fact that God has made you fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you're devaluing your power, then you're not going to use your power. And if you're not believing in your power, then, then you're not going to add value to, to, to your power and bless other people. And so realize that you're wonderfully made. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're wonderfully made. Now, how many of you that made you feel a little uncomfortable? And I'll tell you why. Because we walk, in a, we walk around a culture that beats you up and tells you you're never good enough. But when you start realizing you're created in the image of God and that God loves you and he blessed you and there's nobody else like you, then all of a sudden you're like, yes, that's right. I am wonderfully made because my maker made me this way. And you, your self-doubt uh, uh, and self-esteem, uh, 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 the, the doubt flees away. The self-esteem increases, not because of you on your own, but because of what God has turned you into and made you. And so, you know, I get to thinking about uh, believing in our giftedness. Now, you're not going to realize your power unless you believe in your power. Like, if, if you think, well, I can't sing, I can't sing, I can't sing. Well, if you don't believe you can sing, then you're never going to realize if you can sing. Are you all following? If, if you don't believe, then you will never achieve. And I get all of us have different gifts, and some people really can't sing that well. But if you can talk, you can sing. You just may not have the skills. Isn't that right? But the thought is believing. You know, I got to thinking about this study that Gary Hamill and C.K. Uh, Prehaladad have written about an experiment that conducted with a group of monkeys. Listen to this. Four monkeys were placed in a room that had a tall pole in the center. Suspended from the top of that pole was a bunch of bananas. Anybody like bananas? One of the hungry monkeys started climbing the pole to get something to eat. But just as he reached out to grab a banana, he was doused with a torrent of cold water, squealing. And he scampered down the pole and abandoned his attempt to feed himself. Each monkey made a similar attempt. And each one was drenched with cold, with cold water. They finally gave up. Then researchers removed one of the monkeys from the room and replaced him with a new monkey. As the newcomer began to climb the pole, the other three grabbed him and pulled him down. After trying to climb the pole several times and being dragged down by the others, he finally gave up. The researchers replaced the original monkeys one by one. And each time a new monkey was brought in, he would be dragged down by the others before he could reach the bananas. In time, the room was filled with monkeys who had never received a cold shower. None of them would climb the pole, but not one of them knew why. Unfortunately, people who have gotten used to failure can be a lot like those monkeys. They make the same mistakes again and again, yet they are never quite sure why. 
If you're on the failure freeway, get off by trying something new. And so as you think about this, perhaps you, you're, somebody told you you were no good. A mom or a dad beat you down. Somebody said you couldn't do it. In fact, you think about studies. How many times do you tell your kids no over how many times you tell them yes? Typically, the studies say about 95%. No, you can't have that. 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 And rightfully so on some things. But I'll tell you this. What happens is we stop believing that we can achieve certain things. And now what happens is we, we accustom ourselves to just, no, I can't do it. No, I'm no good. No, I can't see. Just because some teacher said you can't write and gave you an F on a grade doesn't mean you can't write. And just because somebody said you can't doesn't mean that you can't. Amen? It's only when you believe their words that you stop realizing your power. So what we've got to do if we're going to realize our power and let our light shine in your notes, A, there's light in you. Let it glow. I say let it glow. Let it glow. Let it glow, amen? Let it glow. There's light in you. Jesus came to give light to the whole world. He is the light of life. Every single one of us has, has gifting and empowerment inside of us. We just need to let that light glow. B, there's love in you. Let it flow. Let it flow. Look, look to your neighbor and say, I'm going to let it flow. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I love you. Hey, listen, it feels good. Let your love be unconditional. Let your love be unconditional, not because of who they are and what they do, but because of who you are and what Jesus has done for you. That's unconditional love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 speaks about. Listen, if you give your body to be burned and you know the whole Bible and you got all these degrees and you got all this money, but you can't sit there and love your spouse, guess what you are? You're nothing. If you've got all the, all the, the wealth of the world, but you can't sit there and love uh, your child or love your pastor or love somebody that's rude to you, it's worthless. Your love is empty. It's vanity. What does it profit if you gain the whole world, but you lose the love in your heart? And so we need to realize there's love in us. Jesus is in us and many waters cannot stop love. That's what the song of Solomon uh, has. And if some of y'all need that love and feeling to come back in your marriage, go read the the book of Song of Solomon. Okay. And I challenge you to study it out every word and, and do that with your, with your spouse and watch what takes place. Let's go to C. That's all free marital advice. I'll give a seminar on that later. Okay. Uh, C, C, there's life in you. Let it show. Let it show. There's life inside of you. You know, when God created Adam, he breathed into him uh, the the, the breath of life. And we've got to realize that every perfect gift comes from the father of lights with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. Do me a favor. Put your hand right here. Is your heart beating? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm alive. (laughs) Hey, sometimes you forget you're alive. Sometimes you forget that the fact that your heart is beaten means that there's still a reason for you to be here and there's life in you. Uh, look at, uh, look at, uh, uh, D there's laughter in you. Let it go. Let it go. Listen, I love to laugh. Ha, 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 ha. Long and loud and clear. <laughs> hey, you need to laugh. You need to laugh. C is there's life in you. D there's laughter in you guys. You guys keeping up back there? Oh, I guess the joke's on me, or is it on Daniel? No. (laughs) Well, let me give you D. Write it down, okay? Write it in your notes. There's laughter in you. Oh, it's on the opposite page. Oh, it is. I don't even see it on the opposite page of mine, but hey. As long as you can see it, then praise the Lord. Hey, life, life, life will take some, some turns on you. You know what you got to do? You got to learn to laugh at yourself. Amen. You got to learn to laugh at yourself. Have a good time and uh, take it easy a little bit. I like, I like all those proverbs. A merry heart doeth good like a what? Like a medicine. Hey, if you're so stuffy all the time and snarky and just, you got like your Tyrannosaurus Rex arms out or you're like the, the, the fire breathing dragon everywhere you go, you know, you're, no, no wonder why people are going to want to be around you. You need to laugh a little bit. Loosen up. Or if you're so kind of like, everything must be perfect. Everything. Listen, I'm kind of a perfectionist on some things too, but I like to laugh. How about you? Don't you all like to laugh? I like to watch uh, some of the comedians, the clean comedians, and, and have a good time laughing and enjoying. And, and it's a de-stressor. It's a de-stressor. It helps pull off some of that pressure off your heart. And uh, we need to be able to laugh with, uh, with each other. And, and let me say this to you before I go to the next point, number two. Uh, give yourself permission. Give yourself permission to live. 
Can I, can I tell you that? Give yourself permission to love. Give yourself permission to enjoy life. So many times, especially in biblical Christianity and especially inside of biblical fundamental, uh, fundamentalism within Baptist circles, people get so rigid and so stuffy and so like, uh, we must follow the law. And if you get out and you're not a robot and you don't dress like me and talk like me and have the same Bible as me and sing with the same pitch as me, and then I'm going to... And then they start freaking out and getting upset. Good night. I don't want to be in that box. I don't think Jesus puts us in that box. Jesus comes to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And I got to tell you, I don't care how old you are. You can be young. You can be one of the well-aged and mature people in here. But you too need to have a good time. You need to be able to enjoy yourself. There's liberty in Christ. Listen, yes, don't use your liberty as, as an occasion to serve the flesh. But seriously, enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your kids. Enjoy this, 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 this life that God has given to you. Yes, there are souls that need to be reached. Yes, Jesus is on the throne. Yes, he can save them. Yes, we're to preach the gospel. But listen, if people look at you and you are not smiling and having joy in your heart, they're going to look at you and go, what do you have that I would want? Like if, you're, if your life is messed up and you're all critical and angry about everything else, then I'm going to look at you and go, I don't really want anything, to, anything that you're offering. But if, but if you're living life, if you're letting your light shine, if you're being a blessing, if you're loving people, if you're laughing, if you're, I mean, if you're doing it, amen, you're, you're, you're going out and you're saying, you know what, I got the power, you know, and, 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 and you're having a time with it. Listen, you know what happens when you got the power and other people don't have the power? Those who don't have the power start hating on those who do have the power. And, and here's the reason why. Because they don't realize that all they got to do is push the on button for themselves. Amen. All they got to do is open their heart and say, activate me, Jesus. Awake me to righteousness so I can put on strength and I can live the abundant life too. I'd rather, much rather live the abundant life than sit there and read about somebody else and watch somebody else uh, live and, and, and doing the abundant life. How about you? Listen, I want, I want to live the abundant life. I want to realize the power. Give yourself permission, please, to live. Give your, you say, well, I'll die for Jesus. Yeah, but will you live for Jesus? Everybody's going to want to go die for Jesus, but nobody wants to live for Jesus. Like, live for him, love for him, light for him, do all that stuff for him, and be a blessing. Start believing like, I can, I will, I believe, I must, I am a child of God. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am an overcomer. Man, I'm about to drop it down right now. I'm, I'm telling you right now, you got to start believing what God says you are. God says you've got the power. God says that I love you. God says that you're wonderfully made. God says that you can do all things through Christ. God's the one that says that stuff. Come on, that's God. That's God. All you've got to do is start living it and believing it. And, and you say, well, I can't live it and believe it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you've got problems. <laughs> How many of y'all got problems out there? Any of you got problems? Okay, almost all of you. But the ones who didn't raise your hand, you got more problems than other people got problems. <laughs> I will not raise my hand on that one. <laughs> Let me give you number two. Remove your problems. Now, that don't mean take your son or daughter and drop them off somewhere, okay? <laughs> or your husband or wife or, who, or your co-workers, right? Because I'm going to show Let's take a look at the master teacher, Jesus, what he says. Go over at Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter 7. Let's take a look at there. Matthew chapter 7. Y'all are turning over there. The Bible says, judge not, verse number 1, that ye be not judged. Matthew 7, 1. Now, Matthew 7, 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? It's like a speck in your brother's eye. But considerest not the beam or the plank that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say, come on over here, brother. <laughs> Let me pull out the mote or the speck, the little speck in your eye, out of thine eye. And behold, a beam, a plank, a huge plank is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. The idea here is number two, remove your problems. Remove your problems. You know, all of us have problems. Would you all agree to that? Yeah. All, is, all of us have problems. I love this little, uh, this little saying that I read a little while back about the traveler. Uh, you are your lens. Who you are determines the way you see everything. You cannot separate your identity from your perspective. All that you are and every experience you've had color, uh, you've had color how you see things. It is your lens. Here's what I mean. Listen to this. A traveler nearing a great city asked an old man seated by the road. Here's what he asked him. He said, what are the people like in this city? 
Well, well, he says, well, what were they like where you came from? Horrible, the traveler reported. Mean, untrustworthy, detestable in all respects. Ah, said the old man. You will find them the same in the city ahead. Scarcely had the first traveler gone on his way when another stopped to inquire about the people in the city before him. Again, the old man asked about the people in the place uh, the, uh, the traveler uh, has just left. And this man said this. Well, actually, actually, they were, they were fine people. Honest, industrious, and generous to a fault, declared the second traveler. I was actually sorry to leave. The old man responded, that's exactly how you'll find the people here, too. The way people see others is a reflection of themselves. If I'm a trusting person, I will see others as trustworthy. If I'm a critical person, I will see others as critical. If I'm a caring person, I will see others as compassionate. If you change yourself and become the kind of person you desire to be, you will begin to view others in a whole new light. And that will change the way you interact in all your relationships. Be aware of your lens today and interaction with others. The idea here is, with regards to the words of Jesus, if you're casting scorn or you're judging other people or you're snarky or you think, well, everybody's just out to get you, then guess what? The problem is you. Yeah. Say, say it with me. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. Say, say, let's go a little slower. I am the problem. You just told me to believe in myself, preacher. Uh, now you're hurting my self-esteem. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to do is actually help you. You see, you can change. Your, your weaknesses or your, your sins or the lens that you have that is tainted the way that you view other people can be changed. And that's what Jesus is getting at. He's saying, listen, if you look over at your brother and you say, you know what? Hey, you're, you got a little smudge on your face right there, but you got all kinds of chocolate all over your face. Or if you say, you know what? Your shirt's a little bit off right there, but you're all ratty and nested up inside your shirt. You haven't ironed anything. Or you know what? Your, your financial house is in, in disorder over there, but you haven't paid your bills and you're stealing something from some car dealership or somewhere. That, well, here's what he's saying. He's saying, you take care of you first, buddy, and then you go and help somebody else. And I'm all for joy, Jesus, others, you. But I understand this. If you don't learn to take care of you, you cannot take care of me. Did you hear that? If you do not learn to take care of you in your heart, your spirit, your mind, your emotions, build you up in your most holy faith, here's what happens. You start stinking. You start stinking. You know, I like the quote that Zig Ziglar had said. Uh, he said this. Let me see if I can find it. Beautiful quote on, uh, on motivation and uh, bathing. He said, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. <laughs> every day. And the same is true with removing your problems every single day. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, you're not my problem. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that with you. You're not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> you're my problem. No. <laughs> uh, no. The idea here is, listen, the other person that you think is your enemy is not your enemy. You are your enemy. It's your lens. If you, if you have messed up glasses on and you ever have put on glasses before and they're all messed up on the inside, you're like, man, the world's all jacked up. Everything's all scratched out around there. Listen, it's not the world. It's you. Change your glasses. Change your lens. And the idea here is, well, how do you change something on the inside? What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I like it. I keep going, but I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> and I was a little intimidated. <laughs> the idea here is Jesus can cleanse the heart from within. He can remove the sin. In 1 John 1, 8, 9, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's what we need to do. We need to bravely remove our grievances. In your notes, uh, letter A, there's condemnation in you. Confess it. Now, I know the blank is a little tight, so you're going to have to get right real small, okay? Condemnation. There's condemnation in you. If you're condemning other people and because of something that they're doing, understand this. You have a whole lot more to work on you than, than to sit there and start being condemning of them. I got a lot to work with right here. I'm pretty messed up. How about you? Even when I think I got it, man, the flesh pulls me off. 
right? Anybody start doing good for a while and then all of a sudden uh, something of the old nature flips back up. And you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Come on, don't take up your, your halo. No, I'm a saint. I know, but you're also a sinner. <laughs> I'm a saint. No, I'm a sinner. I'm a saint. You ever go through that too? <laughs> you're, you're both. <laughs> You're, you're both. As long as you're in this world and you're a saved Christian, you're a saint, but you still have the old nature, which is your flesh, the old corrupted system. And so therefore, that's why you have to continually confess your sins. If you don't, guess what happens? You get stinky. And your attitude starts messing everybody else up and you think it's them, but really it's you. And so you want to confess your sins. How often should you confess your sins? Daily. Daily. Listen, in fact, you want to get real good at it, confess them right away. Now, don't do it out loud when you're in front of you're like in a business meeting. Well, yes, the uh, proposal is this, and this is the value I will offer. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I thought that this guy's a reprobate, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> don't do that out loud, okay? You've got to just pull that stuff in and do your thing and then peel off and be like, Lord Jesus, help me. I thought bad thought about that guy. I probably shouldn't have thought that. And then come on back. Hello, I'm back with you again. <laughs> And, and the idea here is you want to keep the heart clean so that when you're working with people, you can think the best about them and you can work with them and you can love them. You can be a blessing to them. And so there's, there's condemnation in you. You want to, you want to get rid of it. You want to get, at, get, get out of it. You want to, you want to confess it. Uh, B, there's criticalness in you. Cast it out. There's criticalness in you. The psalmist said it this way. Uh, he says, cleanse me from my secret faults. How many of you have been critical about other people? Like you looked at a sports player, you're like, you know, he shouldn't have thrown that ball that way. Or that preacher, he shouldn't have preached that word like that. Or, you know, why did she wear that? Or why did my boss do this? Or why did the coach do that? You know what that is? That's a critical spirit. And you may be right, but guess what? You're not the coach. You're not the teacher. You're not the pastor. Guess what you are? You are who you are. How are you doing with what you're doing? How would you like somebody else to sit there and, 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 and criticize you over everything you do? Woo! I'm starting to preach, brother. I'm starting to get with it. The idea here is if there's criticalness in you, confess your faults. The only way you're going to get healing on the inside is if you confess it out on the outside. You need to confess it. Uh, C, there's complaint in you. You need to cleanse it. There's complaint in you. The Bible says in the book of Numbers that when they complained, God heard it and it displeased the Lord. In Jude, it says that there were murmurers and complainers among them. In Philippians chapter number two, it says, it says uh, not to be disputing uh, and be murmuring and complaining all the time. It says to be blameless and harmless walking in this perverse world. We need to realize if there's criticalness, if there's complaint or D, if there's comparison, there's comparison in you, clear it. You know that you, there's nobody else like you. Don't try to be somebody else. You will never be them. You are not made to be them. Yes, you can learn. You can grow from from a strategy and a mindset of somebody else. But you still have to be who you are. You shine your light. I shine my light. You don't tell me how to shine my light. I don't tell you how to shine your light. Are you all following? Now, if somebody says, hey, I would like to try to shine my light better. I like the way you're kind of shining your light. Can you show me some methodology and philosophy of how you're doing that? Because maybe you've got a little bit of a burner in there. I can, I can pick it up a little bit. Now you're asking for counsel. But when you're critical and you're comparing, here's what happens when you compare. Now I'm dropping down a few things here to help us with repentance. If you are comparing yourself, if you feel like they're less than you, it builds you up and now you're in pride. That's called sin. So if you're, if you're looking at others and they're lower than you and it builds you up, now you're in pride. If you're looking at others and they're, they're, they're further than you, now it makes you insecure. And guess what that is? That's pride too. Both are false. They're both, there's two ditches on the, side of the, on, both, on the side of the road. So here's what I'm getting at. Is you, that's why the scripture says it's unwise for you to compare. You be you, amen? I like what one guy said when I was taking my mom out there in Catalina. He was going by and uh, we were doing something. He's like, you do you, bro. You do you. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do me right now. <laughs> and the idea here is you don't need to be anybody else. Hey, when David, when David went up to Saul and he's like, Saul, I'm going to go smoke that, uh, that Goliath, right? He didn't say it like that, but I'm getting our, our common vernacular. And, uh, and uh, he's like, I took out the bear. I took out the lion. I took, out, I, I, I took him out. And I'm going to take out Goliath too is what he said. And, uh, and Saul was like, here, why don't you put on my armor? You're going to need my stuff to help you. David puts it on and it doesn't fit him. And understand this, when you, when you try to take other people's armor and you try to take their other stuff, yes, they may have good ideas, they may have good strategies, they may have good methodology, they may have good stuff, but guess what? All that stuff is suited for them. And your biblical Christianity needs to be suited to you. Just right to fit your arms, fit your legs, fit, fit, uh, fit your head, fix, fit all that stuff. You know what David did? 
he said to Saul, he said, listen, I can't, I can't wear your stuff. He threw it down. He said, probably respectfully, because David was a respectful uh, man. And he's like, no, I, I, I can't use this. I, I've got my own tools. Are you listening? I've got my own tools. He went and grabbed his slingshot, right, and his, his five smooth stones. And you know what he, he was using? He was using the tools he had practiced with. Not at the tools that, he, that, that had gone, gone untested. When you and I compare ourselves, what happens is this. If we, if we are trying to be somebody else that we are not, we will try to absorb their tools and they won't fit us. And then guess what happens when we go to fight the Goliath? We lose. Because our confidence is in that person. Or our confidence is in their tools. But when we say, no, I can't do that, I must be me. I've got to do what God's given to me. God's gifted me. God's given me power. I've got a certain skill set. I've got a certain uh, gifting. I'm going to go and I practice a certain thing. And by the way, God's given me power. And so I'm going after Goliath with what I got. And do you know that with what you got is enough? God give, God's given you some good stuff. Did you hear that? God's given you some good stuff. And here's what I'm telling you. If you're going to use the good stuff and believe in the good stuff that God's given to you, You've got to remove the problems, the hindrances, the sins, the things that are besetting you. Whether it's you have a complaining spirit. You say, yeah, but you don't know my spouse. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, you got to get, get it out because I'm going to hammer it here in a minute. <laughs> Maybe I can, Lord, lead me to another one. <laughs> You don't know my boss. You don't know uh, my kids. You don't know this city, San Diego. You don't know the political system. You don't know the gas. Would you please just stop being a victim? Here's what you're doing. You're, you're playing the victim card. Oh, poor me. I can't do it. They're so bad. You're blaming. You're shaming. And guess what you're not doing? You're not taking responsibility for your actions. And you're losing all of your power because you can't change them. And the more you try to go change somebody else, the more you lose. So you're playing the victim card, and because you've got victimization inside of you, you become the loser because you put on the loser. Are you following? Just checking. I'm dropping some stuff here. Are you picking it? I'm throwing some stuff. you catching it? You don't got to be a victim. Stop being a victim. Stop being a victim. Stop blaming others. Stop shaming others. Listen, this is your life. God's blessed you. God's hooked you up. God's gifted you. God's anointed you. God's called you. He's, he's given you all kinds of things. But what you got to do is stop going like this and start going like this. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. A few of you know it. We've got to be able to say, Lord, it's me. I'm my own biggest worst nightmare. I'm, you're your biggest nightmare. You understand that? You. Look in the mirror and go, we're dealing with you today. Are you all following? If you deal with you, here's what you're going to be doing. Instead of looking at the little uh, speck in your husband, your wife's eye, or your kid's eye, your coach's eye, you've got a big old plank in your eye. I mean, you're walking around like this. Can I use this, Brother Rick? This thing's sticking out your head. Oh, I see your, I see your messed up right there. You, you fix yourself. You pick up your, your, your stuff off the ground. and You're never doing this on time. And, uh, 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 that's ridiculous. Isn't it absolutely ridiculous? But that's what we do. And it, here's what I'm saying. Our lens is messed up. We gotta, uh, this is going to do the hard work too, friends. Lord, forgive me. I'm a jacked up, messed up beamer. <laughs> I just come up with that. I got a big old beam in my head. <laughs> you got to pull that beam out of your eye. You say, how do I do that? You confess it. You are, now understand this, you are not your past. Your sins don't have to stay with you. Your traumatic stress, your issues, your memories, guess what? Take them to the cross, nail it to the cross, and walk away free. That's what you got to do if you want victory. That's what you got to do if you want to come out of victimization. That's what you got to do. You've got to be able to say, I'm pulling this thing out. And yes, it hurts. And yes, it's painful. But guess what? You know what's going to come out of you? Criticalness, condemnation, cynicism, comparison. All these things that jack you up and mess you up and hold you down. And by the way, all those things are the things that stop you 
from releasing your potential. See, some of us, we're running well. We're going, but guess what? We got, you ever run with one of those parachutes on your back? You got, not only you got parachutes on your back, you got a weight vest on you. You got weights on your feet. You got weights on your, your, your chest. I've tried to run with all that stuff. It's hard. You know what it feels like when you get all that stuff off? Man, I'm, I'm like, a, what's that guy's name that, that uh, man, I'm Hussein Bolt, man. I bust through like a cheetah. What's the fastest land? I feel like that way. You know what you're going to feel like when you pull off all those sins and all those weights and all, all those beams out of your eye? You change your lens. I'm telling you what, you become that cheetah. And sometimes I get on the treadmill at the gym and I get going and all of a sudden I tell myself, I'm a cheetah. I'm a cheetah. I'm a cheetah. I'm a cheetah. Yeah. Ask Brother Parker. He was there when the cheetah came out. <laughs> I'm telling you what, if you will deal with your issues, then you can, you can release potential. I was talking with a guy the other day and we were having some food and he was telling me in his, uh, in West Virginia, he, uh, it gets real, real cold and it snows. And I guess when in the cold uh, snowy areas, the pipes freeze. Anybody experienced that before? I'm from San Diego, so I don't really know anything about that. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'll stay here as long as you want. You come on back. It's a blessing. Amen. I'll visit that for the snow, ride the hills and all that stuff, but come on back. Well, he was, he was telling me, he was telling me that the pipes freeze. And so he wanted, but he wanted water. I guess what you have to do is you, you leave your water faucet running just a little bit, dripping, not, not too hard, but dripping. Am I getting it right? And, uh, and then the pipes don't freeze. Well, um, well, they didn't do that. They, they, they locked it off and and, uh, and he said he went and hired somebody. It had been two weeks. And he was like, man, I got to get in my house. I guess they were sleeping at the church or something. And he hired a plumber and come on over. And he said, well, what you could do is, is you could heat the pipe and dig it up and heat up, heat up the pipe in certain sections. And, and uh, he was going to do that. And then he decided, no, nah, I'll just wait two more, three more days. He waits. And they, they ended up uh, putting on something on the pipes. I'm not a plumber. You asked Brother Luke or other people about this. Maybe you can educate me later. But uh, they wanted to change the spot where you, where you turn the... the the, the water on and whatnot. They changed that spot and they're thinking, okay, maybe it's that lever or something. And waited a few more days. It still wasn't working. Nothing working, nothing working, nothing working. And so he's finally like, let me hire somebody else. He hired somebody else. Another plumber comes out and uh, they go out there and he checks everything. He checks the, no, it's not working here. Okay, he walks out. He goes to the spot where the lever is and he sees a little button. He goes, Click. and all the water starts rushing again and working again. He had the power. The problem was he didn't know how to use the lever to turn it on. And I believe this. I believe many of, many of us in here today, we have the power. We're looking at the excuses as to why things are not working. It's too cold. I don't have money. I, I, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. And really, oh, it's just one little lever. And the energy, the water, the power will flow right to your dwelling. And that's a real blessing. Let me give you number three. Release your, release your potential. Release your potential. You know, in Matthew 13, let's look at uh, Jesus here. Matthew 13, and I'll, I'll uh, give you these last points rather quickly. I'm starting to get a little hungry. How about you? Yes, I love to eat. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Matthew 13, look what it says here in Matthew 13, verse number 31. Another parable put he forth unto them. I love how Jesus teaches in stories so we can get it. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. So it's the least of all seeds. Is that right? It's the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Understand this about the kingdom of God. It looks so small. But when it's sown, it may start as the least, but it grows to be the biggest, the greatest. And understand this about Christ. Christ come to give you abundant life. He wants you to release your potential. And understand this about your growth in Christianity. You might be here in church, but just because you're here in church, just because you're here in church doesn't mean you're growing. But if you will apply yourself and, and understand this growth happens daily, not in a day. The journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. You don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. If you're going to release your potential, write this down in your notes. Uh, a, there's possibility in you. You need to realize that there's possibility in you. 
sow it. Sow it. Sow sow that, that gifting out. Sow that light out. B, there's promise in you. Share it. Share it. Being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time, but a desire of promise. Think about this. Everything that you hope to accomplish, that you ever hope to accomplish in the past, some of those things happened. It started with a desire. It started with a promise, if you would, inside of you. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The bird waits in the egg. In the highest vision of the soul, a waking potential stirs. Promises are the seedlings of our future. Do you have a promise? I got some promises in me. I got some, some seedlings inside of me, if you would. I got some things inside of me that, that, that are coming busting out. And they've been, they've, been, they've been below the surface for quite some time. Are you all following? Are you all listening? How many of you guys got some stuff inside of you? you got some dreams and some hopes and some ambitions and some desires. You've got some gifting inside of you, and it's been locked up for quite some time. And maybe you feel like that bamboo tree for three years, four years, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then after the, the fourth or fifth year, bam, that thing just starts shooting straight up. I'm telling you what, there's possibility inside of every seed. Jesus Christ said it this way, except a, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Some of us, we need to die to our comfort zone if we're going to grow into the, in, go into the growth zone. You've got to die to self, and you've got to realize, you know what? I cannot grow and, 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 and see that take place as long as I, I, I'm afraid of what everybody else thinks. Are you listening? Some people won't get baptized because they're afraid of what other people think. Some people won't get saved because they're afraid of what other people think. Some people won't start businesses because they won't, they're afraid of what other people think. The fear of man brings a what? I've chosen to live my life not in the fear of man. I'm not going to sit here and live my life being afraid of what everybody else thinks. Because people don't even agree with themselves. One minute, oh, I like you. Next minute, I hate you. I like you. I hate you. I li-. And it's back and forth, back and forth like a, like a bipolar schizophrenic. You say, what is that? That's probably the flesh and the spirit and probably a lot of some other things going on in there. But all of us deal with it. And I've just chosen to say, you know what, Jesus? You've given me light. You've given me gifting. You've given me potential. Now, listen, my light is not your light. and Your light's not my light. We have different abilities. I'm not going to try to be you. You don't try to be me. But I'll tell you this. If we're going to glorify God, we're going to release our potential. We need to turn the power on. We need to be able to say, you know what? I do have possibility in me. I do have potential in me. I do have some seeds in me. I do have some things that God wants to do inside of me. But if once you start, you sow that seed. Don't stop. Don't you stop. We've come this far by faith. See, there's perseverance in you. Show it. Winners never quit and quitters never win. Stick and stay and make it pay. I was watching a lady run in the Olympics uh, uh, my friend posted it on his social media site, and she was getting to the end of her, her marathon, and she was shaking. Just to, she, and then she hit this, this spot, and her whole body was convulsing. And she, she did one of these little side benders. She was like maybe 10 feet from the finish line, and she like couldn't even control her body anymore. And she hits the rail, falls down, and, and shakes a little bit, gets back up. And she quivers and shakes and trembles until she falls into the finish line. And I got to looking at that, I thought, yeah, yeah, let me get some of that energy. Let me get some of that fire. Let me get some of that tenacity. Let me get some of that never quit, do or die. I'm telling you what, give me some of that right there. You know what you need in your life? You need some of that. You say, well, you don't know my situation. I don't need to know your situation. God knows your situation. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit on your church. Don't quit on your family. Don't quit on your life. Don't quit on your son. Don't quit on your daughter. Don't quit on on your life. Don't quit on your potential. Don't you quit. You stick and stay and make it pay. You go all in. You reach your potential. Is it going to be hard? Yeah, it's going to be hard. But guess what? You ain't going to make it if you're griping and crying and complaining and bickering and fussing and, and feuding over all the little things. You can't have all of your focus be focused on the finish line and fussing and feuding over all the dumb things on the sidelines. Am I right? So what you got to do is you got to say, God, give me power. Now, understand this. When you're, when, you're, when you're doing it, when you're coming through and you're persevering, there's something beautiful that happens. D, there's power in you. Shine it. Hey, whether you're the youngest kid in here or you're the, the most senior saint in here. You might be a widow. You might be a, a struggling mama. 
You might be a teenager. You might have multiple grandkids. You might have health issues. I'm telling you right now, there's power in you. There's power in you. All kinds of more power than you think. But you've got to believe. You've got to believe in that power. You've got to bravely deal with your issues. And you've got to be able to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press in further. You say, what can I do? I'm a senior saint. How about setting your life up for a legacy? How about figuring out a way not only bless your kids, but bless the kingdom? You may be at the latter part of your life, but you can set up a, a, a life insurance and bless your family, bless your church. Come on. You can write a few handwritten notes and say, hey, I love you. Thanks for being in church today. Hey, you can pick up the phone and, and do something, even if you're up in years. Hey, you can encourage somebody else. Hey, and, if, and, and, and some of us, we've got all kinds of musical talent in us. If you've got musical talent in you and you're not willing to, to put in the practice, then you're the reason that that talent's not coming out. If you've got ambition and drive, listen, I'm telling you something. God will, God will, God will release it, but you've got to put yourself out there to do it. You know what's going to happen when you put yourself out there? And perhaps you've been there before. Well, what are people going to say? I don't like your haircut. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like the way you talk. I don't like, guess what? I didn't ask you. <laughs> and as long as, listen, as long as you're asking, every, and listen, I'm all for feedback from the right people. But if you're sitting there fretting and, 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 and thinking about what do people, who, listen, you're going to let those same small-minded people control your world? No. Now, let me say this to you. When you're coming through the zone, I don't, I don't care what zone you're in, when you're trying to grow and release your potential, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And you have, a certain, you have a certain barrier that you hit that barrier and you come back down. You hit that barrier and you come back down. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You do good for a while and then, man, you fall back. How are you going to punch through the barrier? You know that you've got more potential in you. I'm telling you, you do it through prayer. You do it through fasting. You do it through believing. You start realizing, no. We're made for more than this. I got more inside. I'm not backing down now. Listen, if you always hit that barrier and you back away, guess what? You're not releasing the light the way you could. So what you got to do is you got to focus and you got to pray and you got to. <sighs> you got to let the spirit's power. Now, is it going to make you sweaty? Man, I just sweat just doing that. Yeah, that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. Because if you keep doing what you've done, you'll keep getting what you got. But if you're going to go to another level, you've got to start believing in yourself. You've got to start, you've got to start bravely dealing with your hindrances. And yeah, it's going to be hard to pull them planks out of the eyes and those sins. But guess what? It's worth it to be able to see clearly and say, I know where I'm running to. And then when you've when you, when you got power in you and you're excelling and, and people are trying to stop you and hold you back and criticizing and condemning... Listen, here's what you got to understand. Haters are going to hate. Unbelievers are going to be unbelieving. But the believer who has power with God and will go out and preach the gospel and shine the light all over the place and say, bless God, God is with me. People can be saved. Listen, the greatest example we've ever had is Jesus Christ. And he said, for this hour came I forth. When everybody was like, no, no, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. He's like, nope. What should I say? Save me from this hour? No, I'm born for this reason. I'm born for this cause. Hey, listen, well, he, aren't you glad he didn't tap out? Hello, anybody, any, anybody know what I'm talking about? He didn't tap out. He didn't quit. Hey, even on this message, I, I know I'm probably preaching a little longer than I was hoping to, probably double the time, but guess what? Are you already tapped out? Are you already given up? Listen, it's only been, what, 45 minutes? We've been in church about an hour and a half. Is that, is that how much you could take? Or do you want to go to another level? I'm telling you what, you want to go to another level, you need to put more skin in the game. Isn't that right? You want to go to another level, you ain't going to get to where you want to go if you keep doing what, you do, what you've been doing. So you've got to be able to say, okay, Sunday morning, how about Sunday night? How about Monday? How about Tuesday? I'm telling you what, there's potential in you. Release it. Release it. You say, what do I got to do to release it? Ten ideas and I'll be out. Activate your belief. Activate your belief. Number two, take inventory of your talents. Hey, your talents are different than mine. You got to use what you got. I'm going to use what I got. Number three, throw away your sin and unbelief. Throw it away. Stop, stop listening to those lies. Number four, take a shot at, a, at an easy target. An easy target. You say, why an easy target? Because if you want to build confidence, you want to build self-esteem, you want to build motivation and momentum, you've got to start with, 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 with baby steps. 
Oh, I hit that target. Let me take another step back. Oh, I hit that. Oh, I hit that. Let me try my, my, my right hand. That was my left hand. Let me try under the basket. Right? So you start with easy targets. You say, I want to get healthy. Start with easy targets. Easy targets. And then you grow it from there. Solomon didn't just speak the 3,000 Proverbs in one sitting. He didn't do it. It was progressive revelation of the root that was from within becoming fruit in his life. Same thing for you and I. Don't walk around like, oh, it's all got to happen right now. Listen, it's, gotta, it's going to happen. Let it happen. Let me give you the next one. Number five, practice your skills. You want to release your potential? You need to practice. You need to get better. You all following? You're not going to get better if you don't practice your game. You've got to practice your skills. Number six, get a mentor or coach. That whole discipleship deal, you know what that is? Mentorship. It's their mind, using the mind of Christ, to pour into you. And if you're seasoned, listen, you want to grow? Pour into somebody else. Because what happens is after you get poured into, if you don't start pouring out, then you, 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 you lose your potential growth. If you're not dispensing, you become a, uh, a reservoir, not a river. That's why in your day we're going to have an offering here in a minute. If you're a stingy person and you don't give, guess what? You're the loser in that deal. Did you hear that? I'm going to say it again, just because I think it's true. You say, aren't you afraid? No, I'm not afraid because I'm going to be a giver. If you have potential in you and you don't release it and be a river, then you become a reservoir. Everything flows into you and you're like the Dead Sea. Nothing comes out. Are you all following? But you get a mentor and they pour into you, then you turn around and you should pour into others. You start pouring into others, then you really start growing in a tremendous way. Uh, number seven, grow your faith and strength. You're not, you haven't arrived yet. Hey, senior saints, you're not done yet. Amen. There's all, you got 50, 60, 70, 80 years of wisdom inside of you. Don't go to the grave with all that stuff inside of you. Right? There's still stuff inside of you. That stuff's got to be poured out. There's legacy in there. You've got to pour that stuff out and, and believe that, man, i got some goods in me. I need to get this stuff out to some, some, some young, young bucks and some, 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 some people that can benefit from it. Number eight, build a support team. Hey, you can't do it all on your own. You need to have a good support team around you. Isn't that right? You need to have a good support team. People that will go the same way with you. Be wise with you. Number nine, delegate to others. How many of y'all are control freaks out there? Any control freaks? <laughs> Don't put your hand down. Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Some of you think, well, if you've got to do a job, you've got to do it on your own. Spoken by an employee or only a self-employed person. You want, you want to see increase. Much increase comes by the strength of the ox. You need to believe in people. First, you must believe in yourself if you're going to believe in other people, though. You believe in yourself, you start adding value yourself, then you start projecting that out and helping others. Then you delegate, you train people, you inspect what you expect, and before you know it, you've got a team of thriving people around you, wise people around you. And number 10, continually improve to new levels. Continually improve to new levels. Never stop growing until the day of Jesus Christ. Always grow. Somewhere in your makeup, there lies a sleeping, there lies sleeping the seed of achievement, which, if aroused and put into action, would carry you to heights such as you may never have hoped to attain. I'll close with this thought. You were designed for accomplishment, engineered for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. God calls you kings and priests. Today, I'm encouraging you to release your potential, remove your problems, and realize you have power. Will you accept that challenge and activate the power of God, remove those issues, and boldly move forward for the glory of God? The choice is yours. I plan on doing that. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's pray.